Nothing can replace a thorough clinical examination of a patient who has presented with a brachial plexus injury. Then why do we need investigations at all? Clinical examination will tell us to a certain extent the roots that are involved and also whether it is a pre-ganglionic or post-ganglionic lesion. But we need to confirm it and we also need to know the nature of the lesion, whether it's a neuropraxia which may recover or a neurotmesis which needs surgery. We need to remember that all investigations are only adjuncts in the complete assessment of the brachial plexus injury. The main investigations come under the categories of histamine test, radiological investigations and electrodiagnostic tests. If the intradermal injection of histamine in an anesthetic area of the upper limb causes the triple response that is redness, wheel and flare, then the lesion has to be proximal to the dorsal root ganglion which indicates a pre-ganglionic lesion. We shall be dealing with the following radiological investigations as we go along. X-rays do give important clues about the underlying injury to the plexus. For example, a fracture of the first rib can point to injury to the lower part of the plexus and also the subclavian vessels. Similarly, fractures of the cervical spine transverse process can point to root level injuries and plain X-ray of the chest can reveal a hemidiaphragmatic paralysis caused by injury to the phrenic nerve which may indicate injury to the upper part of the plexus. Fracture of the clavicle may point to an injury to the divisions of the plexus and fracture of the other ribs may preclude the use of the intercostal nerves for transfer. The next investigation usually ordered is the myelogram to demonstrate the traumatic pseudomeningocele. The nerve roots as they arise from the spinal cord and before they exit through the vertebral foramen, they are enveloped by a layer of the arachnoid. When the spinal roots are avulsed, there remains a rent in the arachnoid layer through which the cerebral spinal fluid leaks out. It is not covered by a layer of the meninges to call it a true meningocele, but it is covered by the surrounding soft tissues, hence called a pseudomeningocele. It can be visualized by the injection of a dye through the subarachnoid space. This pseudomeningocele is an indirect evidence of the preganglionic lesion. Conventional myelography entails more radiation exposure and is less specific, hence a CT myelography is preferred. This CT myelography not only shows a pseudomeningocele, it also allows separate evaluation of ventral and dorsal roots detection of intradural nerve defects and enhancement of intradural nerve roots and stumps. This is how it appears on the myelogram showing the ventral roots and the dorsal roots. This picture shows the typical findings of a complete root avulsion with a traumatic pseudomeningocele. We cannot identify either the ventral or the dorsal roots in this picture. This picture shows a traumatic pseudomeningocele but both the dorsal and ventral roots are visualized. Here, the dorsal root is visualized, but the ventral root is not. These images show the traumatic pseudomeningocele in different views. Nagano et al. have classified the appearance of the nerve roots as they appear from the vertebral foramen. N represents the normal shadow. It shows a sign of normality or it could be a postganglionic lesion. A1 shows slightly abnormal root sleeve shadow in which the shadows of the roots and rootlets can be recognized. It could be either a preganglionic or a postganglionic lesion. A2 represents obliteration of the tip of the root sleeve, but the shadows of the roots or rootlets are visible. This indicates a preganglionic lesion. In the A3 grade, there is again an obliteration of the tip of the root sleeve, but the shadows of the roots are not visible. This too indicates a preganglionic lesion. The grade D also indicates a preganglionic lesion. Here, there is a defect instead of a root sleeve shadow. And M represents a traumatic pseudomeningocele. We need to remember that the pseudomeningocele does not manifest immediately after the injury. After the injury, there is a blood clot that seals off the rent in the arachnoid layer, which takes about a month to resolve, only after which a CT myelogram will demonstrate a classical pseudomeningocele. The next investigation done is usually an MRI of the brachial plexus. It has certain advantages like a higher soft tissue contrast, 
It can differentiate intravascular flow and multiplanar capabilities. MRI can depict more lesions apart from root injuries and a formed pseudomeningocele. It can depict the brachial plexus almost in total and can reveal post-traumatic neuromas and the concomitant inflammatory response of the surrounding tissues. MRI images usually come in three types, sagittal views, coronal views and axial views along the course of the nerves. We need to understand two other things in MRI, the T1 and T2 weighted images. The T1 images are taken by a shorter spin ratio and the T2 images by a longer spin ratio. It is easier to understand that on the T1 images, the nerves appear dark and in the T2 weighted images, the nerves appear bright and whiter in color. In general, the T1 weighted images are for defining anatomy, T2 images are for comparing with the normal structures and then we have the STIR and the fat suppressed sequence. So what all can we see in an MRI? We can see the root avulsions, we can see lateral displacement of the cords, we can see pseudomeningocils, spinal cord edema and even denervation atrophy. When there is an avulsion of the roots on one side, as you can see here, the intact roots on the other side tend to pull the spinal cord away towards that side, causing a lateral displacement of the cord. How does the MRI help us in perfecting our diagnosis? First is, MRI helps us in differentiating between preganglionic and postganglionic lesions. The first direct sign is the anatomical continuity of the roots indicating a postganglionic lesion or otherwise. Even if there is a structurally intact nerve root, post contrast sequence may show abnormal enhancement of the injured nerve root relative to the control side, which again indicates that it may be a preganglionic lesion too. Indirect signs of preganglionic lesion like the traumatic pseudomeningocele and contralateral deviation of the spinal cord can also be visualized. Similarly, focal edema causing a hyperintense T2 signal and anatomic discontinuity indicate postganglionic lesions. MRIs can also help to differentiate between neuropraxia and neurotmesis. When the injured nerve shows an increased signal on T2 sequence due to endoneural or perineural edema, it indicates neurotmesis. Differences in the nerve signal intensity can also help to differentiate between neuropraxia and neurotmesis. High resolution images with 3 Tesla MR neurography also help to visualize the brachial plexus. In cases of concomitant subclavian artery injury, an MR angiography would also be indicated. The need for electrodiagnostic studies is manifold. First is the pre-operative assessment. Electrodiagnostic studies help to confirm the diagnosis, pinpoint the lesions and determine the severity of the axial discontinuity. Intraoperative electrophysiological studies can suggest nerves as potential donors for surgical procedures and can also study the involved segment of the nerve where it is doubtful. Even after brachial plexus surgery or just following up a patient with a brachial plexus injury, electrophysiological studies will help to study the re of the upper limb. The main types of electrical studies that we are going to see are nerve conduction studies, needle electromyography and somatosensory or motor evoked potentials. Nerve conduction studies are mainly divided into motor conduction and sensory conduction studies. The motor conduction studies are done systematically on the nerves of the upper limb. When the particular nerves are stimulated, there is an electrical activity recorded over the respective muscles. This activity is called the CMAP, the Compound Motor Action Potential. This is characteristically a biphasic or sometimes a triphasic wave. It is represented by amplitude, duration, latency and the conduction velocity. The amplitude, that is the height, depends on the number of surviving axons. If we have only 50 to 75 percent of surviving axons when compared to the other side, it indicates a moderate axon loss. More than 75 percent indicates a severe axon loss. And absent CMAP indicates no viable axons in the nerve studied. Likewise, when there is a progressive increase in the amplitude from a muscle on serial studies, it would signify re-innervation of that muscle with more axons growing in. 
So when do we ask for a nerve conduction study? The sensory nerve action potentials drop by day 5 and reach their lowest by day 11 post injury, whereas motor amplitudes drop by day 3 and reach lowest by day 7. Hence, nerve conduction studies can be advised by 10 to 12 days, whereas needle EMG studies are detected only by 3 weeks post injury. If a nerve conduction study is ordered very early, that is at second day or third day, there are some peculiar findings that we shall see now. We shall also be seeing how nerve conduction studies can help differentiate between neuropraxia and neurotmesis. When there is a total transection of the nerve, a proximal stimulation immediately after injury will yield no response. A distal stimulation will yield a normal CMAP. The same stimulation in a neuropraxia immediately after injury will yield no response in a proximal stimulation and in a distal stimulation will yield a normal CMAP. So we have seen that both total transaction and neuropraxia behave the same way electrically immediately after injury. Whereas after 3 weeks, a proximal stimulation in a total transaction again will yield no response and a distal stimulation also will yield no response. This will differ from a neuropraxia lesion where after 3 weeks, a proximal stimulation will yield no response but a distal stimulation will continue to yield a normal CMAP from the muscles. Sensory nerve action potentials are recorded systematically as was done for the motor nerve action potentials. Here the sensory nerve potentials are recorded from the little finger representing the ulnar nerve. The recording of the action potential is as shown. The sensory nerve action potential is different from the compound motor action potential in that it has got a lower amplitude, shorter duration and is triphasic. The sensory nerve action potentials also help us to differentiate a preganglionic from a postganglionic lesion. If there is a preganglionic injury, that is, it is found proximal to the dorsal root ganglion, it produces a complete distal sensory loss. But it preserves distal sensory conduction and we get a good SNAP. This is because the dorsal root ganglion is still intact. If the injury is postganglionic, no sensory nerve action potential is recorded. So, if the stimulated area is anesthetic to touch, Recording a sensory nerve action potential from that area indicates a preganglionic injury to that particular root. This works best for the assessment of C8 and T1 rather than the upper segments. The needle EMG is also an important part of the nerve conduction study. Here, a needle is inserted into the muscle that is being studied and the electrical activities within the muscle are recorded. When the needle is inserted into the muscle, there are three phases of activity that can be seen. The first phase consists of the insertional activity which occurs in response to the needle being placed into the muscle. The second phase occurs with the needle inside the muscle and the muscle is at rest. The third phase of EMG activity occurs when the contraction of the muscle begins and the force starts increasing. In a normal muscle, this is how the EMG looks like. In the first phase, you have got a little bit of contraction in the insertional activity. In the second phase, there is no activity in the muscle while the muscle is at rest. When the muscle starts contracting, the motor unit action potential develops and as the force increases, more and more fibers are included in the contraction. In a denervated muscle, we do not see any of the features that we noted in a normal muscle. We see instead certain other features like the fibrillation potentials, the positive sharp waves and the prolonged F wave. The fibrillation potentials are seen earlier in the proximal muscles when the denervation process reaches them quicker. Along with these fibrillation potentials, we may also be able to see some voluntary motor unit potentials. This signifies a better prognosis. This is representative of the fibrillation potentials in the denervated muscle. Denervated muscles also show some positive sharp waves. The F wave is a different sort of wave where a stimulus leads to an antidromic conduction and again it reaches the muscle and causes a small F wave indicative of denervation and possible re-innervation. We have seen the changes in a denervated muscle. When the muscle starts getting re-innervated, there are certain signs 
which can be detected by the EMG. First is the occurrence of nascent potentials, the presence of unstable polyphasic potentials, decreased number of fibrillation potentials and increasing number of motor unit potentials. Though EMG may show re we must coordinate clinically. The nascent motor potentials that are sometimes recorded in the re muscle are of short duration, small amplitude and polyphasic waves. Normally, the axon innervates many muscle fibers in the normal muscle. We have already seen the changes that occur in a denervated muscle. When the axon starts growing slowly into the muscle fibers one by one, we get the nascent action potentials, which are typically polyphasic in nature. When there is an evidence of early innervation on conventional EMG, that is by 6 to 9 months, there is no need for a nerve grafting because the re has already started. But when a greater distance needs to be traversed because the muscle is very distal, we cannot afford to wait for so long. Electromyography also helps us in another way. The changes in the rhomboid and serratus anterior muscles and the paraspinal musculature may indicate proximal damage. This may be useful when clinical examination is not very conclusive. So to sum up the findings, these are the activities that are seen in a normal muscle on EMG and the activities that are seen in a denervated muscle are also shown. The electrodiagnostic studies also come in useful during the surgical procedure by way of nerve action potentials and the evoke potentials. On exploration, when we find a segment of the nerve that we find equivocal, we are in a dilemma. Whether to excise that segment and do a nerve grafting or do a neurolysis and leave it alone. Here, we record the electrical activity by stimulating proximally and recording distally across that involved segment of the nerve. If there is a nerve action potential that develops, it is a normal segment and neurolysis will be enough. If there is an abnormal wave, it means that the segment is involved and resection and grafting is ideal. The next dilemma comes when we find a good nerve root and want to use it as a donor for our nerve reconstruction of the brachial plexus. The doubt comes whether it is actually connected to the spinal cord or there has been some disruption inside which is not visible. So we electrically stimulate the nerve that is available and get, try to get a recording from the scalp region. If we do get a recording, it indicates that there is a continuity of the available root with the spinal cord. This is known as the somatosensory evoked potential. If there is a disruption of the nerve root from the spinal cord also, we will not get a somatosensory evoked potential. The fallacy of this test is that even if only a few hundred fibers are intact, we will get an evoke potential. Failure to obtain an evoke potential may be more significant in this situation. Electrodiagnostic studies are also important in the follow-up of patients with brachial plexus injuries who have either had a surgery or who are re on their own. When nerve transfers have been done, the target muscle should be sampled while activating the primary muscle. That is, when an intercostal nerve transfer has been done to the biceps muscle, needle EMG at the time of first follow-up should pick up motor units from the biceps with deep inspiration, that is stimulation of the intercostal nerve. Likewise, after contralateral C7 transfer, a somatosensory evoke potential test can be done to record a potential from the supraclavicular region of the affected side while stimulating the unaffected arm to show presence of potentials contralaterally. This will indicate that the nerve has achieved anatomical continuity. Thank you for watching.